So I wanted to uh, uh, tell you, I understand the background of the audience is broad, but I'm going to pretend everybody knows a bit of nonlinear algebra. Um, otherwise, we will never get anywhere. So I'm going to try to give you a high level overview of my recent interest in how to mix commutative algebra with statistics and learning. And down here on the bottom, I write statistics maps to uh, nonlinear algebra because typically I work in the other direction, but now I'm very curious about learning these algebraic structures, which is the theme of the workshop. And I know, I think we can agree that the, the algebraist's interest in randomness is multifaceted. There are many different ways in which you can get interested as an algebraist. So this talk will highlight two of these faces. The first one is, can I use statistics and machine learning to improve Buchberger's algorithm? I'll give more details, but this is just an overview of what the talk will be. In particular, what does this mean? It means, can I learn stuff from samples? Can I learn something about how to improve a classical algorithm using samples? And can I do a machine learning application? And can I do this any better than, uh, let's say, uninformed in an uninformed way? Can I use a simpler model? Uh, why am I trying to be so complicated, use machine learning? Is machine learning even usable on such a problem, right? It seems very sexy to try to apply this fancy new tool of machine learning, of different aspects of it to algebra, but sometimes the problem is just so complex and the data is not. Machine learning tends to perform well, I think, when you get um, um, lots of variability in the data, but sort of an easy learnable structure you're trying to discover, but perhaps these algebraic problems are the opposite. So we don't even know a priori that anything is learnable. So a typical question you might want to ask is pick your favorite invariant of a polynomial ideal algebraic variety, wherever you want. Can you predict, can you use, for example, a neural network to predict this quantity? And does your prediction do any better than, let's say, linear regression, in which case, if it doesn't, I mean, this is a wasted time, right? The second uh, face of an algebraic interest in randomness is understanding how you actually generate data for learning. Okay, so I want to use statistics and I want to use the probabilistic method, of which I'll say a little bit, to generate samples in a quote controlled way. So, for example, I'm going to generate randomly a family of ideals and I want to know whether a given property is generic or extreme. So take your favorite ideal, you know, all toric ideals coming from biological, you know, genetic models in biology. Does I have your favorite property? Is it zero dimensional? Is that medically calling Macaulay? You pick a property. Can you tell me whether your ideal has that property? So, I mean, this is a question that theoretically we like to answer, okay? But um, if you don't know the entire family of ideals, you need to generate a sample that is representative enough of this family, right? And in order to do this, you want to generate the samples in a controlled way, okay? And when I say probabilistic method, I'm actually referring to a very specific thing which you will see uh, come up. And so this talk is basically highlighting the two-step process uh, that I've created out of these two phases of my interest in randomness, and that is learning on algebraic dis uh, structures over interstream distributions. So pick your learning method in a way that's hopefully efficient, and make sure distributions capture something interesting and not just all, you know, degenerate in some sense, okay? When I say it like this, it seems pretty obvious. These are the questions that any practitioner, practitioner using any data-oriented method should do. Does your data make any sense? Does your method make any sense, right? So um, let me define what I mean by a satisfying answer about uh, generating a distribution of your uh, algebraic objects. So I want to use a formal probabilistic framework. I want to understand whether a specific algebraic event is expected or extreme. Think generic, right? And I want to generate distributions that capture this somehow. There's a long history of using randomness in commutative algebra, computational algebra, if you will. Um, and there are different phases of that, and I really cannot uh, you know, cover them all. I just thought I'd give you a couple of examples. Uh, in the 30s, uh, uh, Littlewood and Offord started, uh, studied random varieties. So, for example, you can ask, what is the expected number of real roots of a random algebraic equation? Where a random algebraic equation means you probably fix a degree and the number of variables, and then you stick in a random coefficients, right? You can make that problem different if you like. Or you can verify whether certain identity holds by randomizing 
randomized algorithms, or you can do something that recently came up as smoothed analysis of algorithms. So you have a um, um, maybe deterministic algorithm, but you are not studying worst case performance, rather you're studying a um, expected performance. So on average, how well does your algorithm do? So there are all these different aspects of randomness that can enter into algebra, and I acknowledge that this sort of field is very broad. Um, I am now looking at using a formal probabilistic framework to look at algebraic events, okay? So uh, for the first part of the talk, I want to focus on Buchberger's algorithm, and everything will be very high level, so please, if you need more details, feel free to interrupt. Um, the reason I want to focus on Buchberger's algorithm is that, well, as a you know, community of algebra PhD student, it's the first thing you learn, maybe as an undergraduate learning nonlinear algebra, it's the first thing you learn. It's a cornerstone in computational nonlinear algebra. Um, I assume everybody knows it. Uh, if not, please let me know. I'll uh, do a bit of an explanation. And everybody knows that this algorithm is the best we have and really bad. <laughs> Uh, and we cannot have a better algorithm, really, because Buchberger proved, right, that anytime you want to solve a system of polynomial equations, it all boils down to these s pair computations, which blow up exponentially in the number of variables. There's nothing you can do about it. So we know that the expected runtime is doubly exponential. It often works um, really well, but when you increase the number of variables, and when I say increase, I mean more than six, seven, it will not even finish. But there's a folklore result that you can improve runtime by reorganizing the input polynomials. And this is what a lot of improvements on the original algorithm were based on, for Fougere, et cetera, right? And these are now standard in computational algebra packages. So people try to, instead of having a list of polynomials in the original way it was given, study their structure, move them around a bit and process them in different order. And you can actually get significant speed ups, okay? So by reorganizing input, I mean uh, considering considering these uh, S pairs in different order. Now, this is a point where I wish I was in person so I could get people looking at me funny, but uh, hopefully <laughs> this is okay. <laughs> so um, I've been very impressed by a recent result by Dylan Pfeiffer. He was a student of Michael Stillman and co-advised by Hal Halpern Leisner in 2020. Um, his PhD thesis, uh, which uh, produced a couple of papers, one is this joint paper here, actually uses reinforcement learning, um, okay, to discover new S pair selection strategies, and they actually outperform any of these uh, state of the art human design heuristics by 20 to 40 percent. So, what his thesis and this paper actually do, they show that you can learn something about Buchberger's algorithm using machine learning that nobody has thought about doing before. They actually not just used a heuristic to learn something that was known, they actually discovered a new strategy which was not known before. So anybody interested in using uh, reinforcement learning uh, but is not quite sure what reinforcement learning is, I strongly suggest Dylan Pfeiffer's uh, PhD thesis. It's available online. He has a nice explanation of what reinforcement learning is. I'll give you a quick overview in a second. And so the goal of what I wanted to do, inspired by his work, is I want to learn a version of a value function for this problem. Okay, so I'll define it in a second. Um, let me explain. This is uh, to, to give credit to the students. So Dylan is on the top left, and Yelena, who just graduated from Illinois Tech as an undergrad, uh, did all the computations for us and went on to Purdue for grad school. Um, so we just finished this uh, paper on learning um, Buchberger's um, um, uh, performance metric. My screen looks blurred on the meeting. Hopefully you can see it. Is it okay? okay here we go. Yes. So it's too many words, <laughs> I know, but I just wanted to summarize what they did. So what they did was a proof of concept. They focused on the class of random binomial ideals. Why? Because if you're trying to study a complexity of a problem for every polynomial ideal in the universe, uh, we know that binomial ideals can capture all the possible complexities. If you let the number of variables, the degree of the polynomial and the coefficients vary, you can capture every polynomial ideal uh, 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 behavior, right? And so what they did was they looked at randomly generating samples of binomial ideals and they trained some standard deep reinforcement learning uh, techniques, and they did better than uh, what, what is expected. 
So their key contribution was that they uh, represented Buchberger's algorithm as a reinforcement learning problem, which I found so strikingly beautiful. So what is reinforcement learning? You basically have a game where a player or an actor selects these S pairs that are going to be processed. Right? So you have a list of S pairs, and then an actor says, I want this one first, and then this one second, and so on. Right? Uh, I should call it player. So player looks at this and selects, okay, and then um, runs Buchberger and then tries to minimize the overall computational cost of the algorithm, okay? And if the actor or the player um, gets a smaller uh, a computational cost, the actor gets a, the player gets a reward. Uh, think of um, uh, giving a dog a cookie <laughs> if they do a task, right? <laughs> So you're trying to train the actor or the dog to do some task, and uh, as the dog does better and better the task, you give him more and more cookies, right? So they're trying, you know, they eventually learn, oh, I'm gonna do this because now I'm gonna get a cookie. So in the reinforcement learning, that's a very simplistic view, but it's a way <laughs> to envision what reinforcement learning is, right? So you need two things. You need a measure of cost, okay? So you want to minimize the overall cost of the algorithm. And of course, what is cost or how long it takes, right? But you want something that is hardware independent. And so they define the number of polynomial additions performed during the run of the algorithm. So they just pick a metric that is definitely indicative of how hard it is to compute the Grover basis, but it is hardware independent because it's just counting the actual time complexity of the algorithm, not the implementation, okay? And a key part in many of these learning techniques is a value model. I want, as a player, to predict the future reward, right? Ooh, it seems that if I pick things this way, I predict I'm gonna get three cookies instead of two, and then I go that route. So they did not use, uh, they did not use um, this value model uh, prediction in their work because it wasn't quite clear whether you can even learn to predict this future reward, okay? So what we wanted to do in our little project is to figure out, can we learn or predict precisely this? Predict the number of polynomial additions and so that I can uh, get the reward, okay? So you give me, um, I'll stop for one second to see if anybody's very confused. I'm, gi I'm not giving, I'm not defining uh, anything. <laughs> I'm giving a background on how the setup was done in their work. Everything okay? Okay. Maybe you'll interrupt as needed. And so here is the problem then uh, from my point of view, okay? I want to focus on this value as a measure of complexity of the algorithm. And so I want to solve exactly one problem. Given an ideal I, how many polynomial additions are performed during one run of Buber's algorithm to compute the Grover basis? Okay. And so this problem is impossible to, to, to solve, <laughs> so you have to focus on specific families of ideals, right? So uh, because I'm a cognitive algebra based by training, I love toric ideals, but binomial ideals are more general. So we actually had um, studies for both toric and binomial, uh, general binomial ideals. So what we did was for binomial ideals, we used uh, three variables. I know three variables. But that's already complicated enough. You can run this, you know, to get a million samples. It can take a very long time to compute these things. Uh, we did two scenarios. We did uh, A, we did four binomials, generators of the ideal, um, of the degree um, up to 20. So four binomials, degree up to 20, with only three variables. So binomials are just differences of two monomials, right? And then another one is we did 10 binomials, generators of degree up to 20, okay? Um, it well, sufficed to capture the complexities of binomial ideals, and we sort of didn't run out of uh, computation power. For toric ideals, how do you generate random toric ideals to figure out what is, um, to figure out how to solve this problem? Well, toric ideals are defined as a using a matrix, right? So I want to think of a toric ideal as defined using the design matrix A. And so um, A is an integer matrix of size D by eight, which means we have eight variables. Um, okay. 
and then we let d vary. So we had d is equal to 2, or d is equal to 4, or d is equal to 6, and we had a max, maximum number, of, maximum entry in the matrix um, to be either 5 or 10. So you see, I'm already getting into gray areas here. I'm randomly picking numbers. What are these distributions I'm generating? <laughs> right? I mean, I just gave some numbers. Why 4? Why 20? Why 6, 2, 5? And all this stuff. The answer is, when you get started, you don't really know. And this is what leads into the second part of my talk. But there's some reason to believe that this is good enough to capture the complexity of the problem. Okay? And I'll explain what I mean by that later. Here, in the binomial case, we know exactly how many generators of the ideal we have, so either four or ten. Here, I have no idea how many generators of the ideal I have because I have to take the kernel of this matrix and compute the uh, ideal basis. So that, in and of itself, is already a hard problem, so my sample sizes are smaller here. But I'm letting the entries of the matrix go up to ten sometimes, and I'm having eight variables potentially, because if I do three, I get zero ideals all the time, a lot of the times, okay? Um, are there any questions on how we generated the data? Other than it sounds like it's heuristic, it sort of is. So what did we do? Okay, so what it did was, I can just give you a table and say, look, here's a bunch of R squares, but why am I doing what I'm doing? If you're a commutative algebraist, you have some intuitive predictors. So intuitive way to predict Grobman basis complexities, for example, to compute the Castelnuovo Manford regularity, regularity of the ideal I. We all know in algebra that having the regularity somehow captures the complexity of the Grobner basis, but to compute it, this is a catch-22. This is a ridiculous uh, way to predict the complexity because it's really complicated to compute. Nevertheless, I sort of want to you know, figure out uh, what can I, if I knew the regularity, can I predict uh, uh, this number of uh, polynomial additions? The other, um, the other predictors would be a cruel dimension of the polynomial ring mold I, or I guess the degree, right? I mean, these somehow capture the, capture some complexities of the ideal. So these are intuitive predictors that I can certainly use to try to predict, but instead, if I really want to be like a computer, I want to do something that's easier to compute. So I want to compute, I'm calling them with this crazy abbreviation, but these are uh, generator degree statistics. So mean, um, minimum mean, maximum, and standard deviation of a degree of a generator. So generator degree statistics, minimum, maximum, mean and standard deviation. Uh, because I'm generating uh, polynomials with degree up to 20 in the binomial case, I can have, uh, you know, things can go have lower degree or higher degree, and we all know that if I have lower degree polynomials, I'm more likely to finish, or I hope I'm more likely to finish book or algorithm faster. So what we do then is we sort of generate a, whole, a million samples from all these different distributions of ideals, and we look at whether the data set is varied enough. Am I always getting zero dimensional ideals? In which case I'm not capturing anything and so on. So this is like a longer study. So what we do is we compare various linear models uh, by reporting the R squared statistics. Okay. Um, I am not, uh, let's see. Sorry, just one second. I do not, yeah, okay. So R squared statistics. So if you, what is the R squared statistic? So R squared is somehow a statistical measure of, uh, of um, uh, how close the data is to the estimated line. So R squared is some kind of a statistical measure of how close is data um, to estimated um, regression line. And so R squared of zero 
is uh, what, it, what it means is it means that um, uh, that's the baseline model. So this corresponds to always, you always predict the mean. So no matter what you see, you take the average of your data and that's your prediction and you cannot do anything smarter than that. R squared one is the perfect answer. So this is a perfect match. And you can also actually have a negative R squared value, which uh, means that you're doing worse than average guessing. This can happen when you are training the model on a certain data set and then testing in a completely different data set. Okay, so in our cases, what you see is um, from this table, if you just take my word for just R squared being close to one is good, uh, perfect, right? Um, we can have reasonably good models using these degree statistics. So for example, let's focus on this last column you can get a R squared of 0.57, which is not amazing, but I haven't done anything amazing here. I just ran multiple linear regression with a few very easy to compute statistics and I can get a 57% um, uh, R squared, okay? Surprisingly, regularity does much worse. We thought, I mean, we know regularity captures the complexity of Grosvenor basis, but it doesn't, the complexity of this complexity measure of Buchberger's run, okay? And so, in a sense, this is good because I don't want to use uh, statistics for predicting that I am having a hard time computing. I like that this value be the largest of all of them in the table. Okay. Um, there's a lot going on under the under the hood here. So what we did next is then we compared this simple linear regression model to this out of the box machine learning method. Okay. So out of the box machine learning just meant, uh, you know, Dylan opened up a server at Cornell and ran the same, uh, you know, recursive neural network that he ran in his dissertation and just saw how well he did, okay? So what you see is that um, R square improves a lot when you use uh, a learning method beyond just simple regret or multiple regression, okay? So this is the R squared done on a different day. You see the number is different because I'm picking a specific uh, uh, sample. Okay, you can see twice as good <laughs> results when you use neural networks, which is sort of promising because we haven't even done anything um, extremely special. Okay, we just sort of used out of the box machine learning method. And if you compare uh, the predicted versus actual values of these polynomials, you will see that this is for the linear model here. Can you see this is linear and this is the RNN and RNN does better. This black line here represents perfect predictions. That's it if you would have an R square of one. Okay. And so the blue dots are places where we predicted actual polynomial additions versus the predicted polynomial additions, right? So you want this point cloud to be closer <laughs> to the black line, which of course is not going to be exactly on it, but you can see some improvement when you use RNN. And of course we still don't do amazingly. Right, there's a lot of variability in the blue dots, so you need to get this cloud to be thinner, um, and there have to be a million different ways of trying to do that, which we have not yet done. So what we have done is shown that it is possible to learn this performance metric for Buchberger's algorithm using either regression or learning. Learning does better, um, it seems, but there's a lot of room for improvement. So at the end of our paper sort of, you know, discusses what are the possible ways that you can improve specifically, and I will not, uh, you know, cover all those details here. But I just wanted to demonstrate that this is something that's learnable, which to me was um, a shocker, <laughs> honestly. Okay. Um, then, okay, sorry. This is a good time to stop for one second in case there are any questions at the moment. Maybe I'll go back. There is a question. I don't know how to use Teams. Somebody help me. <laughs> it looks like one person has a question. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Can I ask a question? Yes. I, I just wondered if you could say something about whether um, you think it's important or not that the data you trained on was randomly generated as opposed to Grobner basis problems that came from some uh, other area or application. Do you think it's still representative? I think it's a very good question. So I think that's an excellent question. So this really depends on what it is you're trying to learn, okay? <laughs> right, so if you're trying to understand the performance of the algorithm on general ideals, I think it's important to randomly generate the data, um, okay? 
because, and ensure that your capture. So what you can do is you can generate your own million ideals, and then what we plotted is you know the dimension of all of them and the degree of all of them, regularity, and like all the different things, just to see that we have some kind of a distribution, and not all ideals we generate are the same. Because and the reason I think is important is just like in, when you do statistics in general, <laughs> you should not just generate all the data around the same point and then expect to predict over there on the other end, right? So. But if your goal is to try to see how well the algorithm will perform on your application, then you should generate data from that application. And so a perfect example would be solving, for example, these um, identifiability problems in um, you know, algebraic statistics, right? So my ideals there are really not going to be generic, so to speak. They're going to have very special structure, but then I can still generate randomly from that structure, right? So I think. And I think whatever we did here may not apply to a billion other problems, <laughs> even if you're still doing the same algorithm, because it really, I think it, it that it's a great question. It comes down to basically, can you do stats <laughs> using this data, right? And then, yeah. Which, which, and I think that was the only question. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. So this leads precisely to the next part um, of the talk. So thank you for actually asking for that lead in. So I myself am extremely curious about how do I know if I have a good data set? So what we did, actually we had an argument with, um, an argument, a good discussion with uh, Dylan. My iPad did a lag, but anyway, um, eventually the screen will pop up. So I said we were generating ideals. You know what, I give up, I go back to this slide and wait, okay. Uh, I said we generated, you know, binomial ideals and then toric ideals, and you know, Dylan did, wasn't quite sure how do I know I have all the toric ideal complexities, and I wasn't sure he had all the binomial ideals, and I generated them differently. And are you varying coefficients? Are they just plus minus one? There's a million questions. So I think, in my opinion, the best way to actually tackle this is have a formal probabilistic model for your random algebraic structure, and then study what happens. For that model. And then everything you do, all the learning, all the regression, da, 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 applies to that model. So the example I want to show you is uh, monomial ideals because for that we have a model. Okay. And, um, oops, sorry, here we go. And so um, why monomial ideals? Now I'm, now I'm deforming. Okay. <laughs> it's a very simple case, but Monomial ideals are the generations of general ideals. And somehow, if you want to compute various things, you often compute the Grobner basis, take the lead term ideal, and start from there. There's also a strong link to algebraic combinatorics. And there are probabilistic methods there I would like to uh, use. And also, they generalize graphs, because you can think of graphs as uh, uh, edges of a graph, as monomials of degree two for the two vertices. And so you can import the probabilistic method. And so when I say the probabilistic method here, I'm referring to the method that uh, uses probability to discover the existence of a structure with high probability. Okay, so you use some kind of randomness here. You use randomness to your advantage rather than saying, ooh, I don't know if I covered everything. So my goal in general is to actually have a setup for constructing and understanding various distributions of uh, monomial ideals, okay? And if you set up your distribution properly, well, you choose, right? You're, you're, you're the constructor now. <laughs> you're the god of this, uh, of this universe. Then you get to study what happens. What is the average behavior? What are the asymptotic thresholds and what happens, okay? And then in that scenario, when you apply your learning to those kinds of data sets, you will know precisely what you're learning on, okay? So um, this part of the talk is just going to give you like a summary of um, uh, a, a paper, a joint paper with a group of, a couple of papers with a group of people. And no, I did not flip Lily's picture sideways. Hers was sideways on her website. <laughs> okay. Um, so I say this is random commutative algebra part one because you can do a million next steps. Okay. Um, I'm going to fly through the next couple of slides uh, just to give you a motivation of how I think about random monomial ideals. You may be familiar with the erdos rainy model for random graphs where you fix n vertices, you choose a probability parameter, with, with, which gives you the probability of including each edge independently. Okay, So if p is 1 16th and I generate randomly uh, edges in this graph, I might get this graph. 
if P is one eighth, I'm gonna get more edges because <laughs> I'm more likely to pick each edge. If it's a quarter, I get more edges and you see where I'm going, right? And so um, you can make a, um, um, you, you can call this a formal probability model because it gives you a distribution on the set of graphs on n vertices that depend on one parameter p. Okay, so I think of this graph as a random variable that is an observation of a ran oh, sorry, an observation of the random variable g with this particular probability parameter. Okay, and we just use the standard statistics notation. And so the question is, if you have uh, such a graph, what's the probability uh, that you get a if you have such a model, what's the probability of a fixed graph with e edges? Okay. So if E is equal to three, if N is equal to eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, fix a particular graph, with what probability will I observe this graph under my model? This is, a, I guess, a homework. You can compute this. You count how many edges you have, how many non-edges you have, right? Another type of question, you can say, what's the expected degree of a fixed vertex? Fix your favorite vertex in the graph and say, how many neighbors will it have in my random graph? I can answer that too because I have the parameter and I understand that it depends on this P, right? So there's a, there's a whole bunch of work um, on this, on this, in this field and generalizations and whatnot. But I think the important thing to take away is if, you, if you're not familiar with this, the important thing to take away is the role of the model parameter, which is this P. P governs what the graph looks like and the structure of the graph depends on p right higher p more dense the graph and also what happens if you fix p and make n go to infinity do you start to observe some patterns right so this is you know asymptotic probabilistic results on what happens with random graphs and so you can use these techniques from probabilistic combinatorics to see whether for example uh, the graph is connected you know what i'm running out of time i'll skip these doesn't matter um so there's something very special that happens. There are these uh, events called phase transitions for G that basically say the following. Some properties of a graph appear, so to say, suddenly. Okay. If you have a very small pro P probability, you are not going to have a certain property. And if you have a very large P, you're going to have a certain prop property. Think of, for example, appearance of a triangle. Okay. If P is small, there is no triangle. If P is large, I'm suddenly seeing a whole bunch of triangles in the graph, right? I can start highlighting and there's a lot more. So at which point can you be sure that you're going to have a triangle in the graph? Okay, so this is a threshold function. If you can actually find such a function that when P is asymptotically smaller in the function, there's no triangle. Asymptotically larger as a function, there's a triangle. I don't do graph theory, but I like these examples because they give you a visual of what's going on uh, by using these probability models. And then we mimic the same thing for ideals, okay? So let's define an Erdos-Renyi type model for monomial ideals, okay? So say I have two variables because <laughs> I don't know how to draw. So I have two variables, X and Y, okay? Suppose I have a probability parameter, one over six, the same as I, you know, one parameter P, just like I had for the graphs. I have to fix the maximum degree, Z is equal to six. That's this blue line here. And so all the black dots are monomials in two variables, and the black dots below the blue line are monomials up to degree six, right? And so now I'm gonna, with probability one sixth, I'm gonna take uh, each of these points, right? So I flip a coin where yes has the answer with probability one sixth, and no has the answer probability five sixths for each of these dots, and I end up selecting only the red ones, right? And I say, these are the random monomials. Okay, so I've selected the red highlighted um, uh, stuff. And so then, because I selected these red monomials as random generators, I make a random monomial ideal out of those, and that's the shaded uh, region in the graph, right? And so you see, I did not need this as the minimal generator of the ideal, but it was there when I generated it, okay? 
So you see already the nuances, right? You're not going to generate an edge in an edge random graph and say, I don't need that edge. It's implied by the others, <laughs> right? There's no such thing. So, but I can mimic the questions that I'm asking for the graphs. I can say, what is the probability of your favorite monomial ideal? Like I asked you the probability of your favorite graph. Okay, so you pick an ideal in two variables of whose generators have degree at most six and compute the probability under this model. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is the theorem. The theorem, I don't really want to bother you with <laughs> the details, but it, this formula looks like the edward friendly graph formula. Over there, I had p to the number of edges and 1 minus p, you know, n minus number of edges. So it's similar, but it's different, obviously, because I have to account, account for the fact that I had a red dot that wasn't needed in the number of generators. And so the two invariants of the ideal that come into play in this formula are the Betty number, the first Betty number, so the number of corners in my uh, staircase diagram, right? And then the Hilbert function, the number of points underneath the staircase at each degree. Okay. And of course, you can degenerate the formula into square free uh, ideas and get the, you know, the count on the on the associated simplicial complex, which is always fun. Okay. So we can answer a very simple question, which is what's the probability of observing your favorite ideal? But you can also um, um, generalize the models, right? People know more than just graph theory. <laughs> so you can write down simplicial complexes on N, right? And there are models for random simplicial complexes. So uh, it's well known that there is a correspondence between simplicial complexes and square free monomial ideals in the obvious way. The non faces of the simplicial complex give you the monomial generators. Right? And the non face, I mean, it's a duality, right? The Stanley Reasoner duality. And so you can make a more general model that recovers all of the known models of complexes. So complexes are special because they have square free monomial ideals and the random monomial ideal general model can be specialized to all the known models that we know for random clique complexes, cost of harbor model and so on. I won't, I won't define all of these, I don't need them. I'm just letting you know that monomials sort of capture some, something more general that is known on complexes and we can just recover the distributions are uh, going down, okay? But what can, else can I answer? This is very boring, you know, what's the probability of my ideal? So once I have the distribution, I can also say, okay, what are these distributions of invariants? You know, do I know something about the Hilbert function, cruel dimension, weak Lefschetz property, projected dimension, you pick, okay? So what we do is we simulate because we have a fixed model and all we have to do is change P, <laughs> right? We're gonna control what kind of distribution we're gonna get, come up with conjectures and then do it again to improve the model, okay? And so you fill in the blank and you pick other models and it doesn't have to be the error training model, obviously, but that's the simplest one, okay? So the play field is wide open, I think in this area, there's a few, few papers sort of going in this direction, but for general ideals, it's all wide open. So for example, what happens when you study the cruel dimension? Well, it turns out that we end up, uh, you know, you can write down the actual probability <laughs> of a specific uh, cruel dimension. And it looks so uh, just, it's not complicated, it's just very long. And so I don't want to really tell you. And so I can just tell you what the pro formula tells you is that if you have, um, you know, this is random monomial ideals in three variables, okay. Um, of degree at most 10 and the probability is 0.01, then you're going to end up this kind of a dis with this kind of a distribution, okay? And you can generate a sample of 1,000 monomial ideals and get pretty close to that distribution. So this is the theory. This is the data for different cruel dimensions, okay? And of course, you get the cruel dimension to most because all things being equal with the same parameter p, those are that they are the most ideals that exist in this scenario, right? If you would like to change it, you need to change P, right? I'm picking P very small. And if I pick P very small, this is gonna be very few monomials that I'm picking for the corners of my staircase. And when that's the case, I have a theorem that says I'm most likely to get cruel dimension two. And this is the probability with which I'm most likely to get it. Okay, so in a sense, I'm answering the question that you had before I began this part. 
you know, is it important to generate all ideals? Well, if you're trying to learn dimension for whatever, whatever, you know, a domain you have, you need to have a model that generates dimension and maybe you want to make sure that this is more equally spread out. Right? So in this case, like two is most representative and maybe changing P to something else is going to give me a completely different uh, table. And so let's explore that for just a second. We discovered actually this threshold behavior of cruel dimension. So we may define a property in graphs. I had a property that says graph has a triangle. Here I have a property that says cruel dimension is bounded above by T minus one. Okay. There's a function. There's a threshold function so that when you put your probability parameter between these two values, you're asymptotically almost surely going to have this cruel dimension. So this says asymptotically, uh, almost surely. So with high probability tending to one, as you increase uh, D, oh, this is a typo. Who goes to infinity here? D goes to infinity. <laughs> Sorry, the typo. So basically, I, I have a visual um, that for, I can vary the probability parameter from, from zero to one, right? And I get these bands of values where I either get the zero ideal or n minus one dimensional ideal, n minus two, you know, one dimensional, zero dimensional ideal of points, right? And so it's very, it's very well defined and these numbers are not going to jump around. You're not going to have one dimensional here, two dimensional here, like asymptotically almost really this will be the bound on your dimension. Okay. Which is very interesting because maybe you're curious in N minus three dimensional ideals. And so that tells you how to tune your parameter P in this region to exactly get those points. Okay. This is sort of the application of these threshold results. Uh, hopefully that's clear ish <laughs> and so oops sorry so we can do the similar thing for betty numbers the first betty number which is the number of generators of degree d i don't want to write you know read the whole formula i'm just letting you know that we can um write this down and get a similar band when n goes to infinity you get your uh degree generate generators in degree j don't exist <laughs> when j is at most d so uh, how do you read this if um, P is between here and here, you know this will be the maximum of your degree minimal generator. Okay, You may be generating monomials um, of higher degree, but there will not be corners of your diagram. And if you think about it, as P grows, you are selecting more and more monomial dots in the in the picture, right? More and more lattice points. You're filling in the staircase. You need lower and lower degrees of minimal generators, which is why this number goes, oops, I'm sorry, from high to low as P increases. So you think about this as uh, P increases, you fill up the lattice. You fill up the... Um, uh, lattice, right? So you don't need the high degree generators, okay? We can write down a bunch of equations about expectation and so on. And then I thought I'll just show you, you know, we did a bunch of other simulations. How do you know if an ideal is square free? <laughs> you vary n and you vary uh, d and you see a clear pattern for which we don't have a proof. But it looks like the patterns are pretty clear. What is the regularity? Because the normal for regularity for any i generated from this model. I don't know, but it looks like it's converging to something. Okay, so it seems like, and I, I care about regularity because if I can predict regularity, then I can uh, predict the, the width of my uh, resolution, right? The, the, Betty, the Betty table. Uh, what is the projective dimension? You see these thresholds all over the place. You see how for very small P, there's a sort of a clear jump coming up, okay? And another thing with it is, how do you know if uh, an ideal is arithmetically quantum Macaulay? And um, the, the graph here is the proportion of ideals in the sample that are Cohen Macaulay. So CM means, you know, from, it goes from zero to one. So it looks like, you know, 
if your P is 0.25 or as P grows, your proportion of corn Macaulay ideals is approximately 30%, okay? So I have probability of 0.3 of being arithmetic corn Macaulay. So we don't have a proof for this, but we just did a bunch of simulations because it's curious to see even though you even have patterns because this model is so regular and so straightforward to define, okay? Another result which I did not participate in, but I just wanted to write down, this is something that Jesus de la Era, Serkan Hosten, and the two uh, postdoc and students, Robert Krohn and Lily Silverstein, did back in 2019. They actually proved that projective dimension, which is the length of the resolution, also has a threshold, even though it's not a property for which you expect there is a threshold. Okay. Usually when you use graph theory results and these probabilistic methods, you need a monotone property for the existence of a threshold, but they figured out uh, a workaround around that. And then another thing we did is we can extend this to something called the weak Lefschetz property, but being 1022 local, I think I won't give you all the details. Um, but the, ex the exciting thing is, again, when you do simulations from this model, you end up with a clear patterns and we can generate random level algebras and we can compute the expected Hilbert function. So be, having the weak Lefschetz property is something that is very rare and you don't expect an algebra to have it. Um, one way of having this property is having a unimodal um, Hilbert, I mean H vector, the coefficients in the Hilbert function. And we can prove that expected H vector is unimodal, which then implies the weak Lefschetz property. So you can again control this property with P. This is sort of the holy grail of what I wanted to get when we started. Uh, random monomial ideals. I wanted to find a property that I know how to tune my parameters so I can discover that property. And it's very interesting to me that you can actually do this uh, by simulations and also by proof, which is uh, more exciting. So I think I will stop here um, and uh, take questions.